Chapter Five: The State and Urbanization. As familiar as the state is in modern life, its functions well known to every schoolchild, and as unmistakable as it is as a vehicle for domination, the state is nonetheless a phenomenon that is misunderstood across the political spectrum. Liberals and conservatives alike applaud its manifest custody of power, rationalizing it as necessary for maintaining orderly social arrangements, since human nature is, in their view, evidently flawed. Some go further to commend the state as beneficent, a civilizing force, even in optimistic moments, culminating as quote, the end of history. Unquote. Leftists, for their part. Have no illusions about the state as an instrument of domination, but they err in reading its specific features. Marxists tend to think of it as a mere reflex of class domination, and at the same time as a tool suitable for appropriation and use in the interests of the working class, a substitution that merely perpetuates domination. Left libertarians, for their part, rightfully reject the state altogether. But they commonly think of the state in ahistorical terms, as if it had materialized in the mundane world fully formed, a monolith without antecedents. Like the city, however, and like the political and social realms themselves, the state has had a specific historical development. From a primal matrix of hierarchical relationships, it issued gradually, taking a multiplicity of forms and undergoing degrees of development over the course of social evolution. Far from being monolithic, the state, as a rubric, encompasses germinal states, partly formed and unstable quasi-states, empires, monarchies, feudal states, theocracies, republics, social welfare states, autocracies, dictatorships, and totalitarian states. Like all systems of hierarchy and class domination, states take a variety of forms, and their development. Has been, if anything, circuitous and fitful, multifarious and complex. Many modern states are unitary in structure. That is, the power they hold flows unidirectionally from the capital. The localities have little or no power in their own right, essentially doing the bidding of the centre. The French system, for example, is notable for its extreme centralisation, in which local government is kept under tight control by the centre. A direct administrative link runs from Paris down through all the departments and arrondissements to the smallest rural communes. Local officials are responsible to the centre and must carry out its directives. Even the construction of a new school in a small commune requires action from a ministry in Paris. This centralised system was bequeathed upon France by the Constitution of 1791. Most of the European countries that Napoleon invaded adopted it in some version, whence it spread to the other parts of the world. The English system of local government, by contrast, has traditionally been much more decentralised, despite the aggrandising process initiated by Henry II and Henry VII. Municipal corporations, antedating the Norman Conquest, were anciently independent of London, holding powers defined by charters and other patents. Counties, rural and urban districts, rural and urban parishes, boroughs and county boroughs—all of these local jurisdictions were traditionally free from strict control by central authorities. Since the mid-nineteenth century, however, this tradition of local autonomy has been under assault and is now fast disappearing. The rise of the nation-state. Regardless of how unitary or decentralized the state is. It is likely to coexist uneasily with municipal autonomy, with cities and towns that enjoy liberties of any significance. Even in the days of the Roman Empire, the Emperor Augustus and his heirs made the suppression of municipal autonomy a centerpiece of imperial administration. They provided cities with just enough freedom to police themselves and to extract tribute from subject populations, but with little more. Many centuries later. European princes and monarchs took much of the same approach, curtailing municipal freedom where they could, in order to consolidate their own power. Indeed, it was essential to the rise of the nation-state that the power of localities be attenuated, and particularly that fairly autonomous cities be subjugated to the state's bureaucratic, police, and military forces. 
The center first penetrated the localities by establishing unified legal systems over formerly diverse areas. In 12th century England, for example, circuit riding, quote, kings, judges, unquote, spread the common law over the fragmentary feudal jurisdictions. Under Henry II, the system was expanded to encompass both civil and criminal cases, a rationalized system of trials, punishments and juries, and a professional royal judiciary. On the continent, kings and princes imposed Roman legal codes over broad areas in an attempt to clear away thickets of local legal conventions and thereby weaken the sovereignty of localities. Legal unification was backed by force when royal states overran localities and incorporated them, imposing administration from the centre. Even the most ordinary rulers in the early modern period used military force to extend their command. But absolute monarchs in England and France collected enormous power into their own hands, carving out large-scale states from free cities, confederations from localities, and a multiplicity of feudal domains. While central authorities tried to limit the power of local feudal lords, they also restricted the freedoms of vibrant municipalities that impeded the exercise of their absolutism. In 16th century Italy, Machiavelli cynically advised state-building prince, the ruler or monarch seeking dominion, that it is harder to conquer cities that have a history of liberty and self-government than those that are already accustomed to princely domination. French kings and their ministers shared Machiavelli's attitude as the French state engrossed itself at the expense of municipal liberty. In 1463, Louis XI asserted his right to change any town constitution at his own pleasure, quote, without anyone doing more than watching, unquote, while Louis XIII and Richelieu had a fixed policy of, quote, tearing down the city walls, unquote. During the French Revolution, the Jacobin government made no break of this centralising impetus. As we have seen, the constitution of 1791 created the departments, overriding valuable local political features, while in 1793 to 1794, the Robespierreist Committee of Public Safety all but quashed the municipal institutions of revolutionary Paris and of France in general. Increasingly, ascendant monarchical states and later republics imposed pressures and demands on the various cities that lay in their domains, encroaching on their freedoms and usurping their powers. As they built up larger and ever more efficient administrations, states appropriated for themselves functions that had traditionally been the prerogatives of cities. Quote, In truth, there is no sure method of holding them except by despoiling them, and whoever becomes the ruler of a free city and does not destroy it can expect to be destroyed by it, for it can always find a motive for rebellion in the name of liberty and of its ancient usages, which are forgotten neither by lapse of time or by benefits received. Unquote not only in legal jurisdiction, but in economic regulation, coinage, taxation, and even diplomatic relations. Meanwhile, the seemingly incessant wars that kings waged with one another had to be financed. Cities, with all their commercial wealth, became prime targets for royal fundraising. In the process of squeezing cash from cities, monarchs expanded their control over them, a process that gradually stifled civic freedom. By the 17th century, the formerly free city had been all but swallowed up by the monarchical state and incorporated into its centralised structure. Resistance to state encroachment Outside Europe, we find few political concepts that link the city to freedom in opposition to the domination of the state, or that attribute to the city its own political life customs and habits in contradistinction to those of the state. Asian cities, for example, were primarily centres of administration for theocratic monarchies, where state and city existed in continuity and few civic impulses to rebel could find expression. But the liberty-loving town centres of Europe spawned a unique notion of the city as the locus of civic freedom. Indeed, from ancient times to the present, the city has been a major antagonist of state self-aggrandizement and centralization. In the 12th century, as we have seen, the confederation of northern Italian communes, known as the First Lombard League, rebelled against Frederick Barbarossa's attempt to reclaim his imperial rights from the Po Valley communes. 
It was because the confederated communes defeated him in battle at Milan that they gained the 1183 peace that became the basis of their communal liberties. Meanwhile, in France, Nîmes, Avignon and Marseille, having obtained their liberties in the early 13th century, confederated themselves and curtailed the powers of their princes. Etienne Marcel, a popular leader of the Third Estate in 14th century Paris, sought to build an alliance of towns that would, with peasant support, circumscribe and possibly eliminate the powers of the French monarchy. In Northern Europe, many towns and cities confederated not only to promote trade and their common prosperity, but to protect their liberties. 60 to 80 Northern German cities, including major Baltic ports, confederated in the Hanseatic League, which controlled northern sea trade for several centuries. Also, commercial and defensive in nature were the two 13th century Rhenish leagues in what is now Germany. By 1300, most of the municipalities in the South German area of Swabia had gained the status of free imperial cities. That is, they were nearly free from control of the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles IV, and other territorial lords, who nonetheless still claimed authority over them. In a further act of defiance, in 1384, they formed the first Swabian League, the Schwabisch Staatbund, without imperial sanction. As for the Netherlands, in the 14th century, the Flemish communes joined forces in revolt against their overlords, while two centuries later, the Dutch cities and their stadtholders united to overthrow Spanish rule and lay the foundations for a Dutch confederation. In fact, as recently as the 19th century, it was still unclear that the nation-state, rather than the confederation, would define the contours of power in Europe. Federative formations still abounded in Central and Southern Europe. The delay in the creation of Italian and German nation-states was due in great measure to obstacles imposed by cities and their confederacies. And although localist parochialism was also a factor, so was the strong tradition of municipal autonomy and resistance to centralisation. To this day, resistance to state authority continues to be nourished by village, neighbourhood and town community networks. In the 1960s, the Madrid Citizens' movement, structured entirely around neighbourhood groups and institutions, played a major role in weakening the Franco regime. In the late 1980s, the tremors that brought the Soviet Union to collapse were produced in part by movements for regional and local autonomy. When communal movements are on the upsurge, the instability of the nation-state comes to the foreground. Urbanisation Today, the municipality is threatened by forces whose power the rebellious and autonomy-seeking towns of previous centuries could not have imagined. Urbanisation, the immense formless blight of capitalism, is swallowing up the definable, humanly scaled entities that were once cities. Small communities were being absorbed by larger ones, cities by metropolises, and metropolises by huge agglomerations in megalopolitan belts. Sprawl, condominium subdivisions, highways, faceless shopping centres, parking lots, and industrial parks are sweeping ever further into the countryside as well. Such urbanisation bodes ill for the liberatory potential of the cities, let alone for their persistence as the taproots of direct democracy. Indeed, the urbanisation is poised to complete the task that the Roman Caesars, the absolute monarchs and the bourgeois republics undertook long ago, the destruction of the political realm. Today, as we have seen, people in North America and Europe are already losing a sense of the meaning of citizenship and of politics as the practice of democratic community self-management, but they may also be losing sight of the meaning of the city as such. Indeed, the management of a city is coming ever more to resemble the management of a business corporation. A city is now considered successful if it simply earns fiscal surpluses and provides the physical infrastructure required to promote the growth of corporations. It is considered a failure if it is burdened by deficits and otherwise operates inefficiently by commercial and industrial standards. The ethical content of city life is being replaced by entrepreneurial considerations that emphasise the bottom line, in inverted commas, to spur and enhance growth, in inverted commas, that is to accelerate the influx of capital, thereby increasing the local tax base and in general to promote mindless urban expansion. As such, the very foundations for civic democracy are placed at the greatest risk. The Civic Response 
In the United States, the decline of the civic sphere is the subject of considerable hand-wringing by commentators from across the entire political spectrum. Liberals and conservatives alike cast a fond, regretful eye back to a time when Americans were more community-oriented and politically active, more informed about and concerned for public affairs. They rue the loss of the tendency remarked by Tocqueville in 1832 for Americans to form civic and neighbourhood associations, that is, to create civic groups, neighbourhood associations, clubs and the like. When liberals blame the untrammeled power of the corporations for this loss, conservatives blame the tyranny of the centralised state. Libertarian municipalism also regrets the diminution of the public sphere, at the local level of the political realm. But it holds neither capitalism nor the nation-states alone responsible for the loss. Rather, both together are responsible, since they are parts of the same system. The state, as we have seen, was undermining municipal freedoms long before capitalism rose to ascendancy, and it continues to do so by eviscerating community life in favour of bureaucracy. But capitalism, by corroding public activity in favour of the market and creating intense economic pressures on ordinary men and women, has accelerated the demolition of municipal freedoms to the point that they may disappear entirely from the face of Europe and North America. Their synergistic combination has decimated both community life and individuality, and at the same time has forced people to concern themselves with issues of material survival rather than expansive issues of community self-management. Nor does libertarian municipalism agree with the remedies that liberals and conservatives prescribe to restore the civic sphere. Conservatives advocate devolving federal powers, that is, powers of the nation-state, down to the local, that is, state or provincial level, thereby eliminating central bureaucracy. Such a devolution, they believe, would eliminate the dead hand of the central government, so that the free market, in inverted commas, would be able to move its invisible hand freely and restore individual self-reliance and entrepreneurship. This solution is patently inadequate, since enhancing capitalist expansion only accelerates the destruction of the political realm. Liberals, for their part, want to restore the civic sphere by encouraging citizen participation in state processes. They would like citizens to vote, to write their legislators on issues of concern, to participate in electronic, quote, town meetings, unquote, to expand the use of initiative and referendum, or to institute proportional representation. Such means, they argue, would give greater state power to those who would use it to restrain capitalism. But this liberal solution is also problematic, since it leaves intact both capitalism and the nation-state. It is merely an adaptive way to work within the parameters of the nation-state, and to leave capitalism relatively undisturbed, perhaps endowing it with a, quote, human face, unquote. Libertarian municipalism, by contrast, is a revolutionary political philosophy that aims to evict both capitalism and the nation-state and to replace them with more humane and cooperative social relations. As we shall see, it starts with the residual political realm at the local level, working to revive it and to build it into a strong force in its own right, empowering these people so that they are capable of ridding our societies of these destructive social processes. Fortunately, the city as a site of resistance has not yet been entirely obliterated. Submerged as it is within an urbanised nation-state beholden to capitalism, the city nonetheless lingers as a historic presence, a repository of long-standing traditions, sentiments and impulses. It harbours memories of an ancient freedom, of erstwhile self-management, of a long-ago civic liberty for which the oppressed have struggled over centuries of social development. That such traditions, such recollections linger in itself represents a challenge to the nation-state. The municipality, in fact, continues to haunt the state as an irrepressible site for the political self-management. Thus, however much the free community and direct democracy have been eroded by the state, urbanisation and capitalism Self-conscious municipal political life perseveres as a latent prospect, a cherished possibility, a still unfulfilled goal of human emancipation. Today, unfortunately, such memories are too often revived by the right 
rather than the left. In the late 1980s, a chauvinistic Lombard League sprang up in northern Italy, shrewdly trumpeting calls for dismembering the Italian state in favour of regional autonomy. Not coincidentally, the League also sought to end the flow of money that the state channelled from the north, by far Italy's richest area, to the poorer southern part of the country. The movement hearkened back to the medieval confederation of Po Valley cities that defeated the Emperor Barbarossa, although this time the presumed enemy lay not across the Alps, which may be the reason the League quickly changed its name from the Lombard League to the Northern League. But it is a sad commentary on the condition of the libertarian left that its once cherished notions of municipal communalism and confederalism have been co-opted and warped by the right in the service of reactionary ends. Libertarian municipalism is not a taxpayers' revolt. It is not a ploy for allowing the wealthy towns and cities to shed the burden of paying taxes to support poorer towns and cities. On the contrary, as we shall see, it seeks to eliminate altogether the disparities in wealth between rich and poor areas. Today, an antipathy towards central government is fermenting in many Western countries, an antipathy that takes many forms, ranging from mere scepticism about state efficiency to resentment of its usurpations of citizens' power to outright hatred of its encroachments. Before such sentiments are once again exploited by the right, they need to be channeled into enlightened ends. Unless the present competitive, accumulative market society is to be accepted as a natural, quote, end of history, unquote, the political realm must be revived and expanded in a self-conscious movement for municipal direct democracy. Here, the tripartite distinction between society, politics and the state acquires programmatic urgency. The political realm must be revived or created where it does not exist, and its democratic content enlarged beyond the limitations of previous eras, so that it becomes a living arena for change, education, empowerment and confrontation with the state and capital. As the locus of citizen self-management and direct popular citizens is democracy, the political realm is the one arena that has the potential to oppose the nation-state, urbanisation, capitalist society and the blights they inflict on society as a whole.